Hello there, uh, this is Nuclear Reactions Part 3. And Part 3 is about probably one of the most famous physics equations that was ever invented that everybody seems to know, but actually nobody seems to know much about what it really involves. So uh, this was a formula invented or found by Einstein in 1905. Uh, following his work on special relativity. You remember the special relativity that we did in our dynamic universe. So what does uh, E equals mc squared actually stand for? Uh, e stands for energy in joules. Joules obviously abbreviated to capital J. Uh, M stands for mass. And that's measured in kilograms. I'm not going to write kilograms out in full and put kg in brackets. And lastly, um, C is the speed of light. Which, as you know, is constant. 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. But in fact, here we've actually got C squared. And you'll know that if you... Um, Let's see, if you square C to get C squared, you get 9 times 10 to the power of 16. And the units of that would be meters squared per second squared. OK, so what does it really mean? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this formula actually implies that um, Energy can be created from mass, or indeed mass can be converted into energy. Uh, so if you like, uh, what Einstein started with was that uh, energy and mass were proportional. And he worked out that to find out how much energy you got from a certain amount of mass, you had to introduce a constant multiplied by the mass. And that constant was speed of light squared. So that's where the formula comes from, E equals C squared M or M C squared. So what that means <clears throat> is if you uh, increase the energy that an object has, And there might be two, two common ways in which you could do that. You could heat it up. So if I just took a, a lump of metal and uh, <clears throat> heated it up a certain amount, I've increased the amount of energy. Or I could speed it up or increase its velocity. So if something's sitting still and then you start to move it, it's got an increase in kinetic energy. So heating it up would involve some heat energy. Speeding it up would involve some increase in kinetic energy. Then according to the formula, if you increase the amount of energy, either heat or kinetic energy, then as a result, the mass of an object ought to increase as well. So if you increase the energy an object has by heating it up or speeding it up, then the mass of the object will also increase, which is, sounds a little bit um, <coughs> surprising because uh, if you're sitting still and then you get up and go for a run, uh, you don't find yourself getting that much heavier. And the reason why you don't get a measurable amount heavier is because of this, uh, this conversion factor here. So the increase in mass would be equal to the amount of energy increase divided by c squared. Now, c squared is such a huge number, 9 times 10 to the power of 16, that um, if you increase the energy of something, um, then by the time you divide it by c squared, the increase in mass um, is very, very small. And the only time you tend to actually be able to observe this and measure it, measure an increase in mass when you increase the energy is, um, is in particle accelerators where the speed is increased 
dramatically. Um, you can get almost up to the, the speed of light in particle accelerators. Uh, and so if you increase the mass sorry, if you increase the energy by speeding it up, then if its energy is very, very large, when you divide by the speed of light squared, then you actually get a measurable answer for m. So we don't notice this in everyday occurrences. You can't measure the amount of increase in mass of me when I start cycling down the road, or even if uh, Lewis Hamilton's going in his Formula One car, um, he's going pretty fast, but nowhere near enough fast enough to result in something where you could actually say the mass of Lewis Hamilton in his car has increased. Uh, similarly, if you take away mass from something, uh, you can convert it to energy. It works in it works vice versa as well. Okay, so um, <clears throat> that's just a little bit of how you can actually see it in practice uh, on also on the microscopic scale if you've got a particle like a meson um, and we know what a meson is it's a quark anti-quark pair and because the quark and the anti Quark, that's matter, that's antimatter. And these are very, very short lived, these, these particles. Um, and so the um, meson will annihilate it or convert itself into, um, we've done this before, it will convert itself into two opposite um, gamma ray photons. And you can measure the amount of energy that a gamma ray photon has uh, because of a formula which we touched on a little bit. At, um, National 5, and we'll be doing more of in this unit. If you know the frequency of the gamma ray photon, you multiply by another constant, Planck's constant. This is also a formula that was discovered by Einstein. Um, if you take the frequency of the photons and multiply by this number, Planck's constant, you get a certain amount of energy. And then if you use E equals mc squared, and you take the same amount of energy and say, well, how much mass was that you in theory you can work out the mass of the quark anti-quark pair and that actually um, exactly matches the real mass of the meson uh, if you were to actually uh, be able to measure it you can't stick it on a set of scales and measure it but there are ways in physics where you can measure this so um, Einstein's formula here has been verified not only by giving particles more energy and making them go faster and you can measure their what's called their relativistic mass um, you can smack these particles together collide them together in a particle collider uh, the particles have got mass and they release energy or you can just look at particles that are sitting there minding their own business and they decay and the amount of energy they release is also predicted by einstein's equation so it does it does actually work um, when you do these measurements and take into account the theory versus the practicality. Okay, let's move on from that brief introduction uh, to equals mc squared and let's have a look at uh, radioactive decay, which we've done before earlier. Uh, and this is all tying in with this, this whole topic of nuclear reactions is just building on the ideas that we've learned before. It's either the standard model um, or it could be forces on charged particles in um, nuclear fusion reactors being constrained inside magnetic fields. It's looking at radioactive decay. So the whole thing's tied in and we keep dipping backwards and going backwards and forwards around the different subjects. So radioactive decay um, and the mass being converted to energy. Where's all that going on? So we've already seen this. Um, here's a nuclear equation that we've done earlier where the radioactive element radium um, decays into radon gas. And at the same time, it emits an alpha particle that's your alpha particle, the helium nucleus that we've done before. Now, that helium nucleus is shot out. Um, so the, the radon 
radium atom is sitting there minding its own business uh, the, it decays into radon and the alpha particle is emitted at some speed and what you can do is in, in this natural decay process uh, you can actually say all oh, right so okay the alpha particle has come out at a speed it's got kinetic energy there's the energy part of it um, where's that energy come from? Well, it's actually come from a decrease in the mass of these products here. Now, we can add up these numbers. This 226 is equal to 222 plus 4. This is a mass number. It doesn't necessarily relate to the precise masses. And here, here we've got the atomic numbers as well. They balance up. We've done this before. 88 is equal to 86 plus 2. Uh, and so although the mass numbers are the same on each side, the masses aren't. And what you find is if you very carefully work out the mass of the radium, so we've got the mass of the radium here, and on the other side, you have a look at the mass of the radon. Let's rub that a little bit out. The mass of radon plus the mass of the alpha you'll find that this mass here is more than this mass of the particles together so somehow what's happened is that there's some mass that's gone missing and um, we'll do a little bit of writing about that later on. But that missing mass, because this mass here is more than this mass here, you'll find that the missing mass has been converted into energy. What sort of energy? Well, the kinetic energy of the alpha particle that is emitted. So this is another uh, really good example of um Einstein's famous formula. You just can't emit this, get it to come out at a speed uh, unless you get that energy, that kinetic energy from somewhere. And that kinetic energy, E, comes from the difference in the mass, not the actual mass itself, but the difference in the mass of where you started compared with where you finish and the difference in that mass is converted into energy and it's that energy that allows the alpha particle to be ejected with some amount of of speed uh, and again if you look at this this whole reaction here uh, we've got a, a neutron in this radium here and that neutron um, is converted Sorry, this is beta. I should be talking about now that was alpha. But in beta emission, we have a neutron is converted into a proton. And the beta particle is emitted again at some uh, rate of energy. Now, if you actually look up the mass of a, uh, a neutron in the data sheet, it is, I don't remember these, I've got to look it up, 1.6. 7, 5 times 10 to the negative 27 of a kilogram. And the proton is 1.673 times 10 to the negative 27. And then this beta particle, which is um, an electron in effect, is, uh, is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31. If you add that up there and you compare that mass there with that mass there. This mass is less than that mass there. So where's that mass gone? That mass has been converted into energy, and it's that energy, that's kinetic energy, that can get the um, beta particle to get emitted. So we have good experimental evidence and good theoretical, uh, a good theoretical matchup that makes this formula uh, absolutely correct in a number of different ways and we'll be going on to look at that um, in a little bit and the implications it has for things like modern nuclear reactors fission and fusion um, reactions okay <clears throat> so
So let's rub that out. If, if I'm writing it, then you really ought to uh, be making some notes as well. So this mass, more than there. This is less mass. Where's the mass gone? Converted to energy. And in this case, it's kinetic energy, kinetic energy of, of particles that are shot out. That's where their energy comes from. OK, so we've said that this mass is more than this mass and the missing mass, if you like, there are a number of posh terms for the missing mass. I quite like missing mass. So the missing mass on what's the right hand side of the formula compared to the left hand side. And I'll be using this idea of the nuclear equation and the left hand side, which was the, the radium. And on the right hand side was the radon and the alpha particle. Uh, that mass there on the left hand side more than the mass on the right hand side that missing mass has a number of posh names or proper i want to call it posh in in exams but the the official words there there's a number of official terms for this missing mass i don't know why you just can't call it missing mass uh, and these are the words or terms that you may come across in notes or in exams uh, the first one is mass deficit or you could have mass difference. Um, you could have missing mass, as I've said before, or similar to this mass deficit, you might actually have something called the mass defect. Now, the defect doesn't mean that there's something wrong with it. Um, it's not that sort of defect, but these words deficit and defect um, come from Latin and the translation is, in fact, missing. OK. Right, so um, <clears throat> we can actually calculate, if you actually do some very careful, and it needs to be very careful, do some very careful calculations of the mass on the left-hand side. And here's a left-hand side. If we go back to our uh, radium, and that converts into... Uh, radon plus an alpha particle. I'm going to keep talking about this left-hand side and this right-hand side. And the left-hand side is always more, and the right-hand side is always less in terms of mass. More mass, less mass. So if you can work out this mass here, Take away this mass over here of the total amount of mass on the right hand side. That gives you something called a mass deficit or the missing mass. And then you can plug that missing mass into Einstein's formula. That's the missing mass and you'll get uh, an amount of energy. Now, you will be expected to be able to do some calculations and I will be um, giving you some examples of the calculations that we'll be looking at. Um, later on and we'll do some sums and find out mass here find out the mass there take this one away from that one put it in there find out what is the amount of energy that gets released as kinetic energy so that's just a, an introduction to e equals mc squared that was part three um, of what we're doing. So we're now going to move on, guess what, nuclear reactions, uh, part four. And nuclear reactions, part four, is about something called nuclear fission. So part four of this whole nuclear reaction stuff, nuclear, I'm having trouble spelling today, nuclear fission. <coughs> Uh, now, there's two types of um, nuclear fission that we want to look at. You've had a, um, some introduction to nuclear fission at National 5, and you'll be aware that the idea of a nuclear fission is where you get a large, heavy nucleus, uh, and it gets split into 
uh, two smaller bits plus some neutrons, which then go flying off. That's their kinetic energy. The neutrons get uh, forced out at some speed and they go flying off and they bump into um, other atoms. And you get that whole idea of a chain reaction. So some of this will be familiar to you anyway. So let's have a look at nuclear fission. Let's have a look, first of all, at um, the first type of nuclear fission. Type 1 is something called induced fission and it's where you have a neutron and the neutron is sent on a collision path with a big heavy nucleus something like uranium 235 and that is called nuclear bombardment It's where you make a, uh, a neutron deliberately collide with uh, a big heavy nucleus. And this is why it's called induced, because this is what you've seen at National 5, is this neutron is absorbed. We used to talk about it actually splitting it, splitting the atom. But this neutron really is absorbed into the uranium-235, which then becomes uranium-236. Its mass number goes up, so it's being absorbed. Uh, and then the new uranium-236 is quite unstable, and it then splits up into what are called daughter products plus a whole load of extra neutrons. Um, now, neutrons, as we'll see in a minute, these neutrons tend to be... Um, tend to work best. They do this best uh, when these neutrons are called slow neutrons. And in the fission reaction... Uh, you'll remember that we get a number of neutrons which go off and cause more fission. And in this case, I'm going to do an example that involves four neutrons going off. These neutrons actually go off at quite some speed, uh, and that speed is too high. Uh, so these are called fast neutrons. And it's the speed that they go off at is too high for them to be absorbed. And actually what you want is what's called uh, a slow neutron. So this is bombardment of slow neutrons. And how's that? How are these fast neutrons turned into slow neutrons? Well, you need to have them go through a material inside your nuclear fission reactor called a moderator. And the moderator actually slows them down because slow neutrons do better fission. If it was a fast neutron that was coming in here, uh, this um, nuclear fission is splitting up, uh, wouldn't uh, work so well. So what happens is we've got uranium-235 here, we've got a neutron there, and it's absorbed, and the re resulting product is uranium-236. But that uranium-236 is pretty unstable, and it wants to split into two bits, and it can split into uh, what are called daughter products. And one of the daughter products that you might get is barium-144. And the another product that you can get is krypton 89 plus our four neutrons. So we've got one neutron here is absorbed. This splits into two bits, barium and krypton. This is basically radioactive waste uh, that we don't want. And, but we do want these neutrons because we want these neutrons to go on to get slowed down from being fast neutrons into slow neutrons and then to go and get absorbed into another uranium-235 atom and this is where you get your chain reaction um, because you've now got four neutrons which can cause fission with four uranium-235 atoms and each one of those four neutrons four collisions or absorptions will produce another four and so you've got 16 and very soon you get this thing called a chain reaction so as well as having a moderator which slows down your fast neutrons and turns them into slow neutrons. So I'll write here speed 
slowed by something called a moderator. OK, we also, if you don't want this to get out of control, and it will do, you'll get a, a chain reaction and eventually, well, very quickly, your nuclear reactor could blow up if you don't do something about it. That's an example of that was the Chernobyl nuclear reactor explosion where they had an uncontrolled fission reaction. Uh, but what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to soak up some of these. Uh, and if you just want this ticking over, uh, with this release of fast neutrons, and that's your kinetic energy there, and that kinet kinetic energy of particles banging into each other causes heat. Heat can be used to heat up water. Water turns to steam, steam turns to turbine, turbine turns to generator, and there's your nuclear power plant that you've got, nuclear power station. Uh, what you want to do is you want to soak up some of these fast neutrons and the way you do that is you drop into your nuclear reactor you can drop in a thing called a control rod and if i put the uh, literally if i put the control rod down here it soaked up three neutrons and i've only allowed one to get on uh, and escape and that one can go back and cause an extra fission with a new um, uranium-235 atom if you want to speed it up a little bit and you want to produce more heat then you pull out your control rod and you might uh, get two neutrons being absorbed by your control rod and two neutrons would go on uh, and you'd have little pockets of um, uh, of control rods in and control rods out inside your nuclear reactor that just maintains an even keel. Uh, apparently the rods in Chernobyl actually had to be pushed in by a motor and they had some sort of failure of the motor and the control rods they pulled the control rods out and they couldn't put the control rods back in properly um, in in british nuclear reactors they're supposed to be really safe because if you pull out the um the control rod um which is done with with a motor and some sort of electromagnetic circuit if the power goes off the uh, control rod just drops straight back in. It's actually pulled out by some sort of electromagnetic contraption. The electricity goes off, the electromagnet switches off, and the control rod drops back in. That's just how you pick up cars in scrapyards, is you pick a car up with an electromagnet. If you turn the electromagnet off, the car just falls down under the effects of gravity. So apparently the sort of explosion that happened at Chernobyl cannot occur in British nuclear reactors because the control rods aren't physically pulled back in or pushed back in by a motor. They, they drop back in if the electricity goes off. Okay, so all of that sort of stuff is useful background knowledge uh, to... Um, know about nuclear fission and i'll try and just tie that up later on with some notes about that whole heat kinetic energy producing heat and so on I'll, I'll write that down later on but let's stick with this now and what i want to do is i want to write a nuclear equation for this type of reaction here so in equation form i would start off with my neutron uh, it's got no charge that's your atomic number zero um, and it's got a mass number of one and it will um, collide with my uranium two three five and if you were to look up uranium in the periodic table it's got a number of atomic number of 92 there are a number of different isotopes of uranium this is just one of them it's called uranium 235 uh, and that will result in um, <clears throat> some barium. And some krypton, not to be confused with kryptonite, which is something to do with Superman and is entirely um, fictional. <clears throat> krypton plus four more neutrons so that's the entire nuclear reaction of this nuclear fission this induced nuclear fission reaction why is it induced because you're taking a 
uranium atom and you're bombarding it. You're making this thing happen here where it splits into these two daughter products and these extra neutrons which go whizzing off like that. Okay. Uh, you can, I could have put in here uranium-236, and if I wanted the uranium-236 as an intermediary stage, I could put in my uranium-236 which has got the one extra neutron. These two together, uranium-235 and the one neutron make uranium-236. And then I could put in the barium and the krypton and the four neutrons at the end. So I could have an extended nuclear equation which would look like this but often this middle stage is missed out and you just go straight to this this bit here i should really have put an arrow into there because they're not all added together that lot there adds up to uranium 2 Three, six, and that uranium-236 adds up to the uranium-235. But often this middle bit is just omitted and you just go from that part there to that part there. So that's a nuclear bombardment when a neutron is absorbed and that's called induced fission. Okay, so um, you need to have an idea of how this happens. That's what we did at standard grade. Standard grade National 5. It's been around for years. Uh, this was first discovered um, back in the 1930s and nuclear weapons, the race was on to make nuclear weapons in the Second World War is really what spurred all this on. Um, and this idea of pictures has been around for many, many years in exams going back before National 5 to uh, Standard grade and before that to uh, O grade. Uh, this bit with the nuclear equation is very firmly in higher and doing this sort of stuff. And the next bit that I'm going to do, which is actually to look at the masses here. What is the mass here on the left hand side? What is the mass here on the right hand side? This mass is more. This mass is less. That leads to the mass deficit. The mass deficit can be converted to energy using Einstein's equals mc squared formula. That is going to come up now. So we're going to do a worked example, which I'm going to go through step by step with you. Um, and I think it would be a good idea to copy that down as well. So some calculations. This is a real SQA type question. And it's the sort of thing that you could get in an exam. <clears throat> OK, so I've got mine written down here already. Uh, unfortunately, you're going to have to copy it down. So I've got a an induced fission, which is my neutron being uh, absorbed by uranium-235. And that gives... Uh, not barium and krypton, because you can get different daughter products. You don't always have to get the same ones. Uh, we're going to get uh, tellurium. Uh, Teller was uh, an, a scientist working in America in the Second World War who was instrumental in developing the um, first atomic weapons that were dropped on, uh, on Japan. So Teller, his name is remembered in tellurium. Uh, another daughter product is, um, I think this is zirconium, ZR. And then our four extra neutrons that are produced as well. And if you add this up, you get 236 there. And 134 plus 92 plus 4 would also be 236. And on the bottom, if you add up 
52 and 40, you get 92. So the numbers balance. The numbers will always balance. The mass numbers and the atomic numbers always have to balance. But the actual masses, when you get down to fractions of kilograms with um, these products being made here, you'll find that there is some missing mass. So what we want to do is to be able to calculate the mass here. Now, you would be given some information, and I'm going to give you some information, that uranium, one uranium atom, has a mass of 3.901 times 10 to the negative 25 kilograms. And our neutron has a mass of 0 0.017 times 10 to the negative 25 kilograms. This should really, really be uh, 165. Uh, that's the number on the data sheet. Uh, but the SQA may give you different numbers just because this says uh, 1.7 times 10 to the negative 27 in effect here. Don't go and change that to a number from the data sheet. Always work with the numbers that you're given. Okay, so what I can do is I can say, right, what is the mass on that left-hand side? Here's the left-hand side. And this over here is the right-hand side. And I would add those together. Now, that's helpful here because both of these are in uh, units with... Uh, times 10 to the negative 25. So really all I need to do is add up these two bits here, which I can I can do. 7 and 1 is 8. Uh, and then there's a 1 and that's 9. And that comes out to be 3.918 times 10 to the negative 25. You can, all, you can do these without a calculator at this stage. Uh, so that's my mass before this... Um, uh, fission has taken place and then what we want is the mass after so we now need to take some information that's been given to us and we're going to have the tellurium which has got a mass of 2.221 times 10 to the negative 25 kilograms and we've got our zirconium Uh, 1.626 times 10 to the negative 25. And said so all these will be in a table. They'll be given to you. But I'd like you to write them down here so you can see how this is done. And then we've got four neutrons. And four neutrons is just four um, times this number here, which is 0 0.068 times 10 to the negative 25 kilograms, okay? And I'm going to add all those up together. And again, because these are all times 10 to the negative 25, you could save yourself a little bit of time here. Um, and you can just add up these numbers, uh, 8 and 6 and 1 makes 15, uh, 2, 4, and 6 is 10, and 1 is 11, and then... 6 and 1 is 7, 8, 9, and 2 and 1 is 3. You can obviously use your calculator if you don't trust your maths, but that's 3.915 times 10 to the negative 25. So this is the mass after this fission reaction has taken place. And you'll see that this number is bigger than this number bigger by three digits in the last decimal place. Now, if you count the number of significant figures here, one, two, three, four, um, don't start rounding this up. Here's a tip for you. Do not start rounding up these long numbers. If you get a number that's bigger on your calculator than uh, three or four or five um, decimal places, significant figures, you must write them down in the middle in the intervening steps of your calculation. Don't start rounding them up. These are so small that if you start rounding them up, uh, by the time you do your equals MC squared calculation, you'll be 
you'll be out if you start rounding them up. Uh, so what we now do is calculate the mass deficit or missing mass, call it what you like. And if I take 3.915 away from 3.918, I get, I'll do that so you can, 918 minus 3.915 times 10 to the negative 25, you get 0 0.0. 0.3 and that's you can see that there if you organize this all very carefully and neatly you can see that 0 0.003 is the difference there times 10 to the negative 25 kilograms so that is our mass deficit now we want to go on now to use Einstein's formula um, equals mc squared so I'm going to do that on the next page uh, and if you need time to copy this down, you can obviously pause the video, make sure you've got all that down, uh, because I'm going to rub this out now. I'm just going to leave the bottom line on here so I can see it. OK, so I've got my mass deficit. Is that now I'm going to use. Uh, Einstein's formula, I'm going to get the amount of energy that's released. Remember, this energy released is released as kinetic energy um, of those neutrons that are shot out. So the energy released is E equals mc squared. And this m is the mass deficit in this case. So that is equal to this number here, 0 0.003 times 10 to the negative 25 times 3 times 10 to the power of 8 all squared. Okay, and if you put that in your calculator <coughs> and work that out, <coughs> you get something like, and I'm just going to do that now, this is the first time I've actually got my calculator out for this, um, 0, 0, 3 times 10 to the negative 25 times bracket 3 times 10 to the power of 8, close the bracket and square it. Uh, and that comes out to be precisely 2.70 times 10 to the negative 11. And the units of energy are joules. OK, so you can see now how I've managed to uh, start off with some stuff we did in the first couple of sections, nuclear equations, we've moved on to um, what actually happens to the mass, not what happens to the mass numbers, which always work out from left to right, but what actually happens with the mass, that you get missing mass, and that missing mass is converted to energy according to Einstein's famous formula. And that is exactly what you would be expected to do in an SQA type exam question. OK, so just some tips to remember. Don't do any rounding. Uh, this answer is three significant figures, two decimal places. It's been rounded. It actually comes out to be 2.7 naught, 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 naught. So I've just written it down as 2.7 naught, which is three significant figures. Do not do intermediate ra rounding because that will affect the size of this answer, which will affect the size of your final answer, which means you'll lose all your marks. Uh, only do your rounding intermediate in the middle of. Uh, only round your final answer. And as I've said, and keep saying this, that should be to three significant figures or two decimal places. And this is both. So that's, that's OK. Um, always use the figures. Use the figures given. In a question. So the figure, the mass of the um, neutron was given as 0 0.017 times 10 to the negative 25 kilograms. That's the figure you use, although the more accurate figure 
if we have a look at moving the decimal place and sticking in some more accuracy is 1.675 times 10 to the negative 27. Don't be persuaded to say, oh, well, it's neutrons. I'll go back to the data table and I'll have a look. Use the numbers that you're given in the particular question. Okay. Um, now, the last bit, uh, the last bit of information is this is the amount of energy released in one fission. And remember that we can get uh, this fission reaction going on and on. Uh, we've, we could have four. It's not advisable to have those four neutrons go on. We could take one of them or two of them. And there are trillions. Un, you know, it's really difficult to measure the number of individual fission reactions that go on because the number of uh, uranium-235 atoms in uranium fuel in a very large nuclear reactor is going to be enormous. And when you add up all these individual fissions, you actually get an appreciable amount of, of energy. So uh, what can we use this for? If the SQA want you to answer anything, they want you to say basically nuclear power stations. Uh, if you put nuclear weapons, which is in fact a use of this, because what you do is you cause uh, a nuclear fission reaction to take place in a weapon and all that energy coming out at once if it's uncontrolled there's no there's no control rods in a nuclear weapon all that energy is released instantly in an instant chain reaction and you've got yourself a nuclear weapon uh, the sqa will not give you any marks for writing that you can use this energy in a nuclear weapon so don't write about it because they don't like it but it's an actual fact that you can develop nuclear weaponry and uh, I've talked about Chernobyl as well when this uh, little amount of energy got out of control the chain reaction got out of control and the whole reactor blew up uh, that's just really for background information that these things can happen but the, the answer you want um, is what can you use this for this would be used in uh, nuclear fission reactions nuclear fission now reactions where would you use this idea of reactions in a nuclear fission reactor or just a nuclear reactor for short and uh, a little bit more at the end about um, different types of nuclear reactors just as there was some stuff in national five about nuclear reactors uh, fission and fusion reactors we'll come back to that um, later on so that's nuclear fission, which is part four. Um, but nuclear fission part four is actually divided into two bits itself. So uh, this is called induced fission, induced fission. So nuclear reactions part four should have another bit. Um, so there is a second type of nuclear fission and what is that it's called spontaneous fission now induced fission don't you don't need to do this but induced fission is where you take that neutron and you get it absorbed by a big uranium atom uh, and so we cause the fission, which is the splitting up into bits and that release of energy, release of neutrons. That happens because this neutron is fired, if you like, is bombarded, is bombarding the uranium-235. But uh, nuclear fission has been going on ever since the Earth was formed for the last four point, whatever it is, 4.2 billion years or 4.8 billion years Um and spontaneous fission is just natural. And it's thought that this uh, nuclear uh, reaction that happens all the time goes on inside the core of the Earth. And that's what causes the inside of the Earth to heat up and rocks melt and they come out as volcanoes. Um, it's that that gets the Earth, keeps the Earth nice and warm 
internally. So what is spontaneous fission? It's when you get, um, what is it? It's the nucleus splitting of its own accord. So you don't need to have that neutron introduced that goes into splitting it. Uh, so uh, in rocks, there is um, uranium-236. It really exists on its own. We don't need to fire the neutron at uh, uranium-235. Uh, this happens automatically. And the uranium-236, as we know, it's already unstable. We don't need to uh, make it more unstable by introducing a neutron. And that can split up into um, some different daughter products and I'm going to have this time uh, Krypton 92 and I'm going to have Barium 141. Um, that actually should be smaller. Barium 141 should be bigger because it's got bigger mass. All that bigger. Uh, and you get three neutrons. And what do those neutrons do? Um, they can whiz off on their own and they can do that uh, kinetic energy thing. They can bump into other things and on the way and they can heat them up. And so you get heat. Um, what else could you have? We've looked at this one before um, where we've got radium 226 and it will split into two things, radon, 222, we've done this before, um, with an alpha particle. And we've seen this one before. Uh, plus, of course, don't forget the energy. So the neutrons go off <clears throat> and can get absorbed, which tends to happen naturally is there's lots of other stuff in the rock that uranium-236 is found in and that will bump these neutrons will bump into the rock and heat it up because they've got a high high velocity um, where's the energy here uh, well it's the alpha particle get, that gets emitted with speed and it's that energy that kinetic energy that forces or emits the alpha particle out there so no neutron is needed so when uh, nuclei automatically on their own break up that's called spontaneous fission now we should be able to do the nuclear equations for these as well that radon one we've seen again and again um, so i don't want to do that again really but uh, it would look like this uh, 226 82 here's our radon Um, it's not 82, it's 88. And our radon is 86, atomic number 86, uh, mass number 222. And you can see straight away there's a difference of four and there's a difference of two. And that's our 42 helium or it's our alpha particle. So that's the second one in nuclear equation form. You're expected to be able to uh, do these and understand these. Um, and if you were given um, that bit there and you were told, as we've done before, you were told that this is element X and uh, I've got a, a mass number, I've got an atomic number, atomic number Z, mass number A, you would be able to work them out yourself. And once you've worked out the mass number and the atomic number, you look up the atomic number in the periodic table, you're able to find out what that is. That would be a typical exam question, but I'm just giving you the whole the whole equation there. Um, as opposed to the uranium-236, this is our naturally occurring radium, which decays into um, Krypton and barium. Now, these numbers may not be the same as the numbers that we had earlier on. Uh, we had tellurium and zirconium. Um, 
you, you're not forced to always get the same thing. You can get a whole uh, collection of different elements depending on how the atom uh, splits up, and then you can get three neutrons. And if you add all this up, if you add one, four, one, and 92, and three, you should get 236. And if you add 36 and 56, you get 92. So you can do the balancing thing again, or you could be told that this is some unknown element. Um, work out what the mass number and the atomic number is and identify the element. A very, very common sort of question. Okay, so that was nuclear reactions. That was actually nuclear reactions um, part five, which was all about fission. <clears throat> uh, nuclear reactions part six which is about fusion not fission fusion and I would urge you to spell these words properly there's no penalty for incorrectly writing um, plain English words in physics but where there is a need for you to write physics words you must write the physics words properly fusion only has one s uh, fission has two s's and if you got the spelling wrong and you wrote this which is not uh, a physics word at all the sqa or the person marking your paper cannot tell whether you're meaning to say fusion or whether you mean to say fission so you would get no marks not for the spelling the actual spelling but for the fact that it's impossible to work out what version of the two words you were writing down so this would not be accepted as as a spelling um, not as an incorrect spelling because it's not possible to tell what word it is that you're actually trying to explain so make sure you know the difference um, between fission and fusion and know how to spell it uh, later on and indeed at national five um, the words uh, here's another one it's got nothing to do with this section actually but we've got diffraction which is where waves go through a gap and spread out and we've got refraction where light waves change their speed and their direction if you were then to write in an exam diffraction that is is not a word it's it's a spelling mistake if you like but it's because you cannot tell which word you were referring to if you were writing it down in a passage you would get no marks for it not intrinsically for the fact that you've not spelt it properly but for the fact that the sqa cannot distinguish between whether you meant it to be diffraction or refraction and so you don't get marks for that sort of error in the exam so those are words and it's uh, it's highlighted every single year uh, when people are doing this uh, and so it's only right that i emphasize what's going on nuclear fusion <clears throat> uh, this is nuclear reactions part six and again a little bit of uh, national five um revision fission fission with I and two S's was where you have one large nucleus and you split it into smaller bits. Nuclear fusion is where you take small bits and you stick them together to make larger bits. So what is nuclear fusion? It's a process uh, where two lighter nuclei are fused They're fused together to form a single normally a single heavier nucleus So what sort of reaction does that look like in a nuclear reaction form? Uh, well, for instance, um, here's one. <clears throat> and although you don't have to 
remember this as such, you're expected to remember the process. This is small light, the small atomic numbers, small mass numbers, and they are fused together to form some larger um, particle <clears throat> or particles. It is a very small one left over plus some energy. Uh, and you can see that the numbers here, two and three is five, four and one's five, one and one's two and naught. So that's that balances. But once again, this is a larger mass. If you actually measure the mass of this particle, this particle is actually called deuterium. It's an isotope of hydrogen, normal hydrogen. Most hydrogen is just one proton like that. That's normal hydrogen. That makes up uh, 90 something percent. 98% of all hydrogen that exists. Um, this is hydrogen <clears throat> with one extra neutron. It's got a proton and it's got a neutron as well. And it's got a name. And it's called deuterium. And the, it's like duo, D-E-U. Duo is two and it's got a mass number of two. Uh, this is an even heavier isotope of hydrogen and it's called tritium. Tritium like tricycle has got three wheels. This has got um, a mass number of three. And deuterium is, is a naturally occurring isotope. It's found in seawater and you can extract it from seawater. Germans were trying to do this during the Second War because they wanted to create a, um, a fusion device, um, a fusion bomb in effect. Um, and because it's hydrogen, which you can extract from water, is water, obviously H2O, um, every water molecule is made of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. If you can split this up, uh, a small percentage of the hydrogen in water, in, and seawater is really very, very common, uh, a small percentage of hydrogen is this heavier hydrogen, and this deuterium is, is, or is what was known as something called heavy water because you'd get deuterium and oxygen together and because it's got an extra neutron it's it's actually heavier so you can separate it out um, <clears throat> so that's just a little bit of history there deuterium and tritium i've written an equal sign there i'm very sorry that should not be an equal sign that should be an arrow there you go that's um that's what you get Okay, <clears throat> now, as before, the mass on this side, if you actually measure the masses in kilograms of this deuterium and this tritium, and you add all the masses together on this left-hand side, you get more mass here, and you get less mass on the right-hand side when you add up the alpha particle and the neutron or the helium nucleus and the neutron and you get less mass and it's that mass deficit that missing mass that is converted into energy using e equals mc squared so missing mass call it what you like mass deficit mass defect missing mass that's what is converted. It's the little bit that's gone missing when you take that and you subtract from it that. It's that little bit of mass that gives you the energy. Okay. And again, you would be expected to do some calculations on that. And if it's not a calculation on a fusion, fission reaction, sorry, a fission reaction that we did earlier, uh, in part five, it could be um, a fusion reaction where you have to do the numbers. And in fact, that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a, uh, an example now of that. And that's going to be nuclear reactions part seven, which is an example. So I'm going to get my page open again. And... Nuclear reactions part seven is a worked example. Uh, 
of a fusion reaction. Okay, and there are different ways of doing this. <clears throat> um, here is one way of doing it. Uh, the one I wrote down before we had deuterium and tritium. It also works if you combine two deuterium atoms together. And that will give you tritium plus some ordinary hydrogen. So this is one way that fusion reactors work, is that you can start off with deuterium, which you can extract quite easily from water. And that deuterium can react with tritium to give you the helium nucleus that you saw in the previous part, or in fact, two deuterium um, <clears throat> here are being combined or fused together to cause tritium. And that tritium itself can then go on to combine again. Uh, and you've got just plain ordinary hydrogen. Yeah, you'll see that um, there's no really large nasty products. Uh, you do get alpha particles in that last one. But alpha particles are very readily absorbed by um, sheets of paper and things like that, or a few centimeters of air. So uh, overall fusion reactors, a uh, little bit about that coming up. Fusion reactors are much safer than fission reactors because you, the daughter products in a fission reactor, uh, they're highly radioactive, um, whereas a lot of this sort of stuff isn't. So there's there's um, a reaction. What we've got to do is you're going to be given some numbers. I'm going to write them down. You're going to get some masses here. You're going to add up the masses. You're going to get some masses here. You're going to add up the masses. You're going to find that this mass is bigger than that mass. You're going to take that one away from that one. You're going to find the mass deficit. going to use e equals mc squared. Typical exam question. Okay, so what have we got on in our table? We've got uh, deuterium. And these would be given to you. You don't have to work these out. And the mass of a deuterium atom is 3.342 times 10 to the negative 27. And there are two of them on the left-hand side. So you want another one. Two of them. Nobody's saying you've got to do this. You can multiply one by two, but we're going to add them together. Two and two is four. Four and four is eight. Three and three is six. Three and three is six. So my combined mass is 6.684 times 10 to the negative 27. That is my mass before on the left-hand side. Now, afterwards, you're going to get this information in a table. Uh, you've got the tritium, <clears throat> and tritium, somebody has nicely worked out for you. It's a little bit heavier, 5.005 times 10 to the negative 27 of a kilogram. These are all in kilograms, so you should put kilograms in all of that. Uh, the hydrogen on its own, that's ordinary hydrogen. And that is 1.672. times 10 to the negative 27 and you'll say yeah well hydrogen isn't hydrogen just a uh, like a proton and a an electron uh, so isn't the mass um shouldn't that be a little bit more than the mass of a proton and i can look up the proton don't bother looking it up do not bother looking it up and trying to justify why that is um some of the mass in itself is um is used up inside the atom as energy that's a little bit more complicated just use the numbers that you're given please uh, and don't try and second guess actually what a hydrogen atom is just use the masses that you've got uh, five and two is seven naught and seven seven naught and six is six five and one is six times ten to the negative twenty seven and you will see that the mass before is larger than the mass after okay so what is the missing mass or the mass deficit call it what you like is 6.684 
take away 6.677 all times 10 to the negative 27. And with a bit of luck, you'd actually get um, the numbers all to the same powers of 10. If they're not to the same powers of 10 when they're given to you, you're going to have to put them in your calculator and do this. But I can see the differences here. It's basically the difference between 77 and 84, which is naught point um naught what did i say 77 and 84 which is seven naught naught seven times 10 to the negative 27 you can do this on your calculator if you want to um kilograms okay i'm gonna leave that at the bottom of the page just like i did before <clears throat> So I've got my mass deficit there. Um, now, whether you work, have worked this out on your calculator, chances are if you have, you'll get seven, one, two, three, seven times 10 to the negative 20, whatever, four, I think that would be. No, negative 30, sorry, going the other way. doesn't matter whatever the number is on your calculator, stick with the number on your calculator. Do not do any intermediate rounding, as mentioned before. So we're gonna use e equals mc squared. And we're going to find out that the energy released in that fusion reaction is that mass 0.007 times 10 to the negative 27 times 3 times 10 to the power of 8 squared. And I think if I do that on my calculator, 0.007 times 10 to the negative 27 times in brackets 3 times 10 to the power of 8 close the bracket and square it equals uh, 6.30 times 10 to the negative 13 joules and that's another sqa type question in the bag uh, three significant figures two decimal places actually just said 6.3 on my calculator but i'll put the zero in just to make it uh six three significant figures two decimal places and that's the second bit how much energy is released in a fusion reaction okay <clears throat> now i'm going to stop there um th th that's quite a lot of different sections i'm then going to come back and i'm going to do uh, nuclear reactions part seven basically nuclear reactions part seven is pretty short um, but it, it's just about the two types of reactor it's about what goes into a fission reactor what the different bits are it's basically a bit of national five revision same with a fusion reactor what goes into a fusion reactor a little bit about the magnetic containment of the plasma uh, we've done a lot of this before you'll have seen this um, and i'm just going to do that in a separate bit which will only be about five or ten minutes but i really need a break um, because i've been talking i don't know for how long long enough and i need a quick break anyway um, so here you go stop recording <laughs>